<laughs> Y'all, <laughs> this was going to be a powerful episode because I have literally tried to record this video three times. This is the third time. So let's see if this one takes. Um, I, I don't even, <laughs> like, <laughs> where do I start? But y'all, this is, this is episode number five of the one series. So if you have not watch any of the episodes, y'all, you have to go watch them. And I pray, if nothing else, that by the end of this episode, you are convinced that you have to go watch the other four and the introduction, okay? Um, this is a really powerful series. And today, we're talking about how to serve the one. How to serve the one. And we're talking about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, y'all. And the, this is such a rich lesson. I'm so excited to share it with you. But before we get started, please tag someone, okay? Tag someone, your colleague, your team, your supervisor. Um, tag people um, and say, you have to watch this, okay? And then also share it on your timeline. You can even copy the link to this um, video and send it in an email or a text message and say, you got to get in this. You got to check her out, right? You got to check all this out. Um, we haven't seen or heard anything like this in a long time <laughs> um, because y'all are just going to be myself. Um, but then also y'all comment on the video. Let me know that you're here, that you've watched, that, you know, if you have questions, if you have comments, or if it just blessed you, will you take a moment to let me know that? That would really bless me, okay? All right, so let's get started <laughs> for the third time. <laughs> um, all right, so starting um, from chapter four in the book of John, it says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Because people talk, right? Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Now stop right here. What do we see already in these scriptures that Jesus is doing with his team, his executive team, right? His 12. He is empowering them. He has given them, um, uh, he has delegated to them right? And giving them power and authority. Um, so when he sends them out, we know he gave them power and authority um, to rebuke the devil and to heal all kinds of diseases. But we also see that even among tasks, such as baptizing people, that he delegated and empowered them to do that as well. Okay. And we got to do better that as leaders. We really do. But that's not today's episode. So that was great. <laughs> um, so it says that he had to go through Samaria on the way. That's so important. And we're going to talk a little bit more in, in a minute about why. But it says eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Think about that. Jesus, both God and man, but the man who threw off divinity to model for us how we can live by being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do amazing things. And then Jesus has the audacity to say that we won't just do what he did, but we would do greater, me and you that we could do greater than what he did. We could touch more. We could empower more. We could heal more people, mm. do more miracles. We can do it. We can do it. And so it's important to know that we see here that he was tired, that Jesus did get weary. And so when we look at him as a model of leadership, which is a great thing to do, because let me tell you, this is the greatest leadership book ever, okay? M more books have been inspired, more uh, leadership books, bestsellers for those of you who love to read books. Well, you know what? I guarantee you 99.9% .9 of those books have been influenced by the Bible. And if not directly influenced, they the author was influenced 
by someone who was influenced by the Bible. <laughs> okay. That's why I teach um, leadership and instruct principles from the word of God, because not only is it beautiful to know what God's intent is regarding leadership, because it truly is a divine call, but there's so much richness here. The true stories of leaders being challenged, being weary, being tired, but also persevering, doing wonderful, miraculous things and seeing the rewards of their leadership. Yeah, yeah, I love this leadership book. <laughs> and so Jesus was tired. You get tired, I get tired. We get tired, y'all. But what we have to notice here is that him being tired did not stop him from being an impactful leader. He knew, he knew that going through Samaria would cause him to be weary and tired and he did it anyway because the one mattered to him. He did it for the one. He showed up for the one. Oh, is your heart positioned that way as a leader? Now, I'm not saying tire yourself out and overwhelm yourself to the point you're no good to anyone. I'm not saying that. But is your heart positioned in a way that even knowing is going to cause you to, to spend more time with someone for an hour? That is going to cause you to make another trip. That's going to cause you to have another conversation or to have to do something one more time and pull on you, pull on your strength, pull on your energy. Are you still willing to do it for the one who needs you? Okay, let's keep going. And so it says, soon as Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Yeah, his executive team, they were at a conference, you know, this other C-suite executives, um, they were in a meeting, okay? <laughs> and it says the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? That's like saying, I'm a low level employee. Why are you talking to me? Why are you asking me for my opinion? Why are you asking me to do something? We don't interact like that. Is that the culture in your organization? If it is, why is it that way? And is that effective? If you were to talk to um, an entry level employee and of, of a member of your team, okay, within your organization, would they be surprised? Would they be like, why are you talking to me? We don't, we don't interact like that. Question. <laughs> and Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, you would ask me, I'm sorry, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Stop. Y'all, this is how we as leaders have to be, especially as believers. When people act crazy with you and don't want what you got to offer, that's how I feel sometimes in business. I'm like, people act like I'm trying to run drugs through their business or something. I just want to help. <laughs> I just want to help. But I'm saying, if only you understood the power of God working in me. If only you understood the spiritual gifts that I operate in. If only you understood the anointing that I have on my life to teach leadership and to inspire people, to teach, period. You wouldn't be ignoring that email. You would take me up on that offer. You would find the money. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, we have to walk in that level of confidence because that is who God says you are. He says, if only you knew the gift that God wants to give you through me, all these spiritual gifts that God has given us, all the spiritual gifts that God has given you, do you walk with that confidence in your leadership? 
that, oh, if you only knew the gifts of prophecy and wisdom and knowledge and miracles and, and, and the ability to pray in tongues when we don't even know what to pray for. Y'all, the gift of vision and all of that. Do you walk in your leadership with that kind of confidence because you know who God says you are? And the gifts God has given you to be a blessing to others. You need to know. You need to know. He says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water you talking about? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? Uh, yes. <laughs> He's Jesus. But you don't know that. I'm going to excuse you. <laughs> it says, how can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give you will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Three core values of Leap My Heart. Discipline, development, and discipleship. Discipleship. Let's just speak in general terms. Do others come to believe what you believe? Are others inspired to do what you do? Are others motivated to develop in the way that you are developing and to walk alongside you? Are they in agreement with that? Because at the core of discipleship, that's what it is. It's, it's instructing, it's mentoring, it's teaching, it's empowering and encouraging people to walk alongside with you, to want what you want, to do what you do, to desire what you desire. So when we look at discipleship from the standpoint that you have the greatest gift of all, Jesus. <laughs> and when you see people downhearted and brokenhearted and just dis out outright disgusted by life. Do you look at it as saying, this is an opportunity for me to be light? Is this an opportunity for, for me to give them something that is gonna help continue to be a source of strength and renewal in their life? Not just a one-time thing. I can, I can give you a compliment. I can tell you how good your performance was this week. I could... Um, give you the time off that you're requesting, but that that would only suffice and 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 fix something that's going on with you for a moment, for a moment. But when we look at it as, but if I teach you how to pray, encourage you to seek God and to develop a relationship with him and to read the word of God and to seek him, his wisdom for yourself. That's the gift that keeps on giving. And you don't have to be all like super religious and inappropriate and, and all that when you do this. Can you just be the example? Sometimes it's just asking the question, and, and giving giving them a way out beforehand and saying, you don't, you don't have to say yes. You won't offend me. I won't feel any kind of way about it. But do you mind if I pray with you about this situation? Do you mind if I share um, an encouraging scripture, which is a quote? You know, we're we're willing to share everybody else's quote, but the moment you share a quote from the scripture, from the Bible is a problem. <laughs> it's how we see things. It's how we see things. Maybe you're not sharing scripture. Just tell them the story. Let me tell you the story about a woman who was an outcast, rejected by society, made mistake after mistake, 
but still feeling misused and abused and how an encounter with one man who saw her and loved her changed everything. Can I tell you that story? There you go. Okay. That's how we do it. And I have a whole like workshop on that. If you want to know how to share the gospel and to be the light in darkness without being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Out of line, I guess. Let's just say out of line. We can talk about it. Okay. So he says, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, right? But those who drink the water I give you will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water because I'm tired of coming to this well at the hardest time of, hottest time of day. <laughs> she didn't say that. I added that. But she did say, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Okay. And he says, go and get your husband. Ooh. We're getting personal. Jesus told her, I don't have a husband. The woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly speak the truth. Do you know anything about your team outside of work? Now, I'm not saying you go and lay it all on the line like this, like Jesus did. You're not Jesus. Like this is this is a time when we have to differentiate the leadership of Jesus versus the sovereignty and lordship of Jesus, okay? This is him acting now as Lord, okay? Don't come at people like that. But do you know anything else about your team members, their hobbies, what they love, what they admire? What do they aspire to be, to become, to have? Their hopes, what are they afraid of? Do you know anything else? about them that shows them that I see you. I see you. Not just as an employee, I don't even like that word, but as a team member, as a vital part of this body, this organization, I see you. Mm. If you haven't, you need to get to know them. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you have had five husbands. Okay. And then he, she says, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that the Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? While we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worship. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one, the one, all right. You worship while we Jews know all about them for salvation comes through the Jews, but the time is coming. Indeed is here now when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. The father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask. What do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? Would your executive team be like that? Why are you interacting with someone who's entry level or mid level? Why are you asking them for their opinion? Why are you holding a focus group? Why are you eating with these people? Why, why are you being social with them? Is that the kind of culture you have in your organization? Is this, so they say, come and see a man. I'm sorry, the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. 
Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. So she began to be a huge advocate and voice for Jesus's leadership because he took the time to talk to her, to see her, to care for her, and to, and to meet a need. To meet a need. When was the last time you did that? This is the, this is the posture of service we should have for the people on our team. Being willing to go out of the way for one. Because you don't know how you influencing and taking the time to, to speak with, with different members of your organization at various levels, how that will impact the culture of your entire organization. When people meet you, they should be blown away at your humility, how you see them, your care, your active listening. When was the last time your team had the opportunity to be blown away by your character? That's what it means to serve and to be humble. To be humble and to realize that everyone deserves that. The one, right? The one deserves that. And so I love, I love this. So really quick, I don't want to make this more than 30 minutes. So leadership principles to extract. Number one, breaking down barriers. Whether it's departments, where it is the level a person is at, their background, whatever those demographics are that are unusual in your organization, break down those barriers. Don't be afraid to interact with people that is uncommon to interact with in your organization because they need to be seen too. Number two, listen actively. And we've talked about that, right? Leaders prioritize listening and understanding the perspectives and needs of others. Number three, empathy and understanding. That's so almost self-explanatory, but we know that empathy is crucial as to understanding where people are and where they come from. Number four, meet people where they are. And this is the whole premise of Lead My Heart. Don't lead this. Hey, come in. Or I need to get this done. Make it happen. That's easy. That's quick. But it's also not getting you the results you want or the commitment that you want in your organization from your team. But when you lead this. And you speak to what people need. And that's what Jesus was saying to her. I know you need water. I got the water that you need. I know you need clarity and more training. I can make that happen, right? It's like whatever it is that that person needs. I know you need to feel more part of this organization and, and like you belong. I, I, I can make that happen. Right. Let's take the necessary steps to make that happen. Number five, transformative conversations. OK, take the time to talk to people. Oh, my gosh, we don't want to do this enough because it's hard and it's vulnerable and you have to be transparent. Who wants that? <laughs> Who wants that? But it's necessary for the change that we want to see. Number six, offer guidance and insight. When they ask a question, answer them. It's real simple. And number seven, being authentic and transparent. Jesus was revealed himself to her. So it wasn't just her transparency that we see and her being honest up and owning up to the fact that, yeah, I did that. That's me. Yes, you, you're right. I'm that person. But Jesus revealed who he was as well and trusted her with that. 
But I want to give some advice to the one who's being served. Because too often I see in organizations when you have a, a servant leader who's going out of their way to serve, you have the one who is not receiving of it. You have the one that might say, I'm not here to know you like that. I'm not here to, you know, get to know people. Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad for you to be somewhere the majority of your life and not wanting to be meaningful and develop meaningful relationships. So I rebuke that. And that's what I'm working hard to, to change. So number one, embrace vulnerability. You have to. Okay, when your leaders come to you, they're wanting to sit with you. They're wanting to ask you questions. Embrace that vulnerability and realize that they're being vulnerable as well with you. So be vulnerable with them. Number five, seek understanding, not just answers. Okay, so if you ask a question and you get an answer that you're not quite sure that you understand, follow up. Okay, number six. Be willing to change perspectives. Oh my gosh. And that's on both sides, really. Going into a conversation, being willing to change your mind. I got a whole workshop on that too. <laughs> okay, on effective communication and having crucial conversations and what that looks like. But one of the components is you've got to go into that conversation being willing to change your mind. If you're only there to say what needs to be said, you don't want to understand, you only want to say what you know what you had planned to say, what you rehearsed to say, and not truly get an understanding, you're going into it the wrong way and it won't be effective. And number seven, share the experience with others. Okay, that's so important. Just like she did, share the good experiences. Please, please don't forsake um, running and telling, right? Run, like we say, run and tell that. So often we want to run and tell the bad stuff. But please, please, as the one who's being served, be willing to share the good too and to run and tell that to the team. Y'all, y'all won't believe, you know, who I just had a conversation with who listened and really wanted to understand. Okay, so y'all, <laughs> yay! This is recording number three. Got it done. <laughs> I pray that um, this is a blessing to you. I'm sorry it's not this way, but this just worked out better for me. Um, but I pray that this is a blessing to you. And I want to wish you all a very happy, safe, loving, renewing, energizing. And Christ-centered Thanksgiving. I, I really do. If you need, if relationships need to be healed, trust God to heal them. If you need to have those crucial conversations, have them. But go in willing to change your mind. Okay. Um, Thanksgiving is a beautiful time of year. But also we have to realize that as people are bringing family and friends together and people may not have family and friends you know, or have that type of community set up, let's look out for our team members. Okay. And if you're able to invite some to your home, let's do that to ensure that everyone will be surrounded by love um, and goodness this holiday season. Okay. Also, I want to remind you all that I'm running a promotion on two workshops, right? Or not so much workshops. They're not workshops. I don't want to say that because I don't include a workbook. In these, but I'm running a promotion on two talks. One is the Ministry of Excellence, and the other one is the Diversity of Diversity. Yes, it's so diverse. <laughs> um, and oftentimes we limit ourselves to what diversity looks like in our organization. So let's not do that. Okay. So um, doing that. So check out um, my social media for more information on that. Okay. I love you all. God bless you. And remember, in everything you do, and with everything you have, love God and love people. Goodbye.